Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts, what will happen if we don't change? And what can we do to create a better future? I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. Civility is not politeness. Uh, It's not necessarily turn-taking, and it's not being demure in rigorous conversation. Where you have the city being uncivil with one another, then the city really ceases to exist. The the civilization cannot hold together because you no longer have any kind of answerability. And in the context of uh, democratic life, then democratic life falls apart. The question then becomes, what do we have in common? What are are our common interests and how should we behave in order to be able to even determine what those common interests are? I know what I'm about to say will make me sound about a million years old, but is it just me or are we becoming more rude? With a global pandemic mostly behind us, it seems, and this might all be in my head, that society emerged from months of lockdown and we all forgot how to interact with other people. I'm not excluding myself. I've had to start singing karaoke in the car to keep myself from flipping out when another driver cuts me off. But more about that another time. But if it was the pandemic that turned us all into barbarians, how long will it take for us to get things back to normal? Surely we should have readjusted by now. And are we using that as a way to let ourselves off the hook? Does anyone else feel like we've all become a little more angry and a little less polite? Today on the podcast, we're talking about civility. Its many layers go much deeper than simple common courtesy. Our expert guests may even convince you that the integrity of some of our most important social structures depends on it. Civility is more than just being polite. It's a virtue that binds us all together in the common life, fostering productive, respectful dialogue and rigorous conversation. The global challenges ahead of us are immense. Will heightened tensions lead to heightened aggression? And is it too late to stop social media algorithms and media sensationalism from dehumanising us further and stirring up even more contempt? Keep listening to find out what happens next. Uh, My name is Stephen Zeck. I am a uh, senior lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Relations at Monash University, and I am super engaged in research on contentious politics. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Would you consider yourself a civil person? I'd like to think so. You know, when people say that, we have to say, well, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Uh, how would you define a civil person? Well, I think it's, you know, it's, it's clearly an aspirational concept, you know, and it comes laden with a bit of judgment, but um, we like to unpack it for its different dimensions. There's a bit of a thin civility and a thick civility mm. where the thin is very much about politeness and these kind of everyday exchanges, etiquette, manners, um, that sort of thing. So again, politeness, but then there's something you can go a little deeper. And that's much more about those kind of moral questions and justifying your aims and policies and that sort of thing. It's interesting because one of the first things you said is that you think civility is aspirational. Mm. My sense with at least some people today, when we talk about the big cultural issues of our time, is that civility is actually seen with disdain, that if you are too civil, it's that you're not morally serious, that you are not taking the big issues seriously like you should, and if you were taking them seriously, that you would behave in an uncivil way. Yes and no. You know, I think, that, you know, civility can certainly be weaponized. You know, it can be this kind of tool to oppress, to silence and all those other civility things. Civility shaming. Exactly. But I think that, you know, at its core, you know, it's that social lubricant. It's the thing that makes social life possible, political life possible. When you have disagreements, when you have these kind of differences in society, it's that thing that lets us potentially cooperate and live better together. In their work examining civility, Steve and his co-researcher Matteo Bonotti have also worked closely with Professor Lucas Walsh, Director of the Monash Centre for Youth Policy and Education Practice. Broadly speaking, someone like Andrew Peterson in the UK would divide civility into everyday civility, which are those, that's politeness, niceness, that I was talking about before. And then this political civility, which relates to one's disposition or attitude or interactions with others as a kind of a virtue of uh, democracy. Mm. 
there's other subdivisions underneath that. So, for example, we see uh, academics actually from Monash University break it down into forms of justif- justificatory civility. So colleagues from here at Monash University uh, do break it down into further categories. So there is the ordinary civility, the everyday civility that we've just mentioned. There's moral civility, which is much deeper than everyday politeness. It relates to your openness to discussion mm. your, and an attentiveness to others and a kind of a commitment to the common good. And then this justificatory civility, which is where decisions are, the, the decisions made by decision makers don't just reflect a sectarian or a particular ethical view, but are, are grounded in that common good, that they need to be able to justify what they do as part of a wider set of values um, and not just one particular group. So they're the different kinds of civility. What we see in terms of the the changes and the emergence of new kind of civility is, for example, in the ways in which we conduct everyday interactions. You know, your your area is is education. And so obviously a big part of that would be um, education of young people. And I wonder, do you think in your experience are the young people of today having a a new experience, a new take on civility, or is that simply that every older generation has always said, younger people these days, they have no manners, they don't do things the right way, there's no civility, they don't respect their elders. Is this just the common complaint of the older generation, always about the younger generation who are trying to often make positive change? So two parts to my answer. The first is that if we look to what I would consider to be kind of leading thinkers, such as Andrew Peterson in the United Kingdom, he points out that empirically finding a decline in civility is very difficult. So there's no clear empirical evidence of a decline in civility. Uh, And therefore, he says, it's much more about perception. And we can come back to that because uh, social media has amplified that perception. It's taken a conversation between you and I that might be a a challenging conversation and equipped it with a megaphone. Then there's the second side to it, which is more an anecdotal one, that that incivility is by no means, in any stretch of the imagination, confined to young people in the societies that we've been talking about. That we see, I would personally say, I see so-called adults behaving extremely poorly Um, that that breakdown is not necessarily confined to a a, a generation, if indeed it is a breakdown. Steve's research actually has identified a rise in uncivil behaviours, especially in the wake of major stressful events. A global pandemic, for example. Are we becoming less civil or do I just feel that because I'm getting old and grumpy and every old person believes that the younger generation are rude monsters? You're not wrong. It seems like every decade there's the new claims of, has civility ever been this bad sort of thing? And, it, and there is evidence to suggest that it is getting worse, though. You know, So huh. a lot of the research we've been doing and then the research that does exist, there seems to be evidence that, at least incrementally in some contexts, so say Australian politicians, for example, we've done research where we went in and looked at 120 years of Hansard records mm. and there have, you know, coding for language, dismissive language and cursing and then, you know, the way that they actually justify policies, which is a dimension of civility that we look at. Um, yes, it's gotten incrementally worse huh. and there's more pronounced effects in some of the U.S. studies when it's looking at people's experiences of incivility, especially in the workplace following COVID. But Compared with the same types of questions just 10 or 20 years earlier, it's gotten worse. People are more frequently experiencing incivility. So why do you think we are becoming less civil? You said your research has showed maybe over the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah. What happened 15 years ago? Well, you know, it's and it's it's just certain types of actors. So when huh. we when we do disaggregate that civility of pol- incivility of politicians in, in here in Australia, for example, it'll be more like fringe parties do carry those subtle differences that you generally have more or less consistent, um, you know, levels of incivility by the centrist parties on the left and the right, or, you know, so looking at labor, liberal coalition with nationals. Mm. So it's more or less, um, you know, certain types of actors, I guess, that are more uncivil. Mm. So that's with politicians. Do you think mm. the everyday person on the street in Australia is becoming less civil? 
I like to be a bit optimistic about it. I don't think so. I think we hear more about it, sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that there are moments, there are crises, particular events where incivility might be kind of a flashpoint or come out more. And what I mean by that is something like unintentional impoliteness as a dimension of civility, because we again disaggregate as this kind of thin incivility around these kind of cordiality. And when we had something like COVID, we lost our signals. You, you had clear things where you smile, disarming mm. smiles and the handshakes and you know the commentaries we make in certain settings. When all that's thrown up and we don't know how to cue anymore and you can't sit down and interact with the wait staff in the same way or you're passing a stranger as you're walking along the bay in your five kilometer radius and you can't smile because of the mask, you come up with new signals to try and again to signal this, we're in this together, things are happening. But you know, this is the kind of, again, the social lubricants of everyday life um, that we set up to kind of just make everything much smoother. Yeah, right. So I imagine it's not just that we couldn't see each other's faces to smile and we had to be apart and we had to engage online, which mm -hmm. does make things weird at mm -hmm. best, but everyone was incredibly stressed. Mm -hmm. And does is stress a big incivility instigator? Yes. Um, again, sort of a lot of the general research on this, see, there are differences in incivility in the online space and under certain conditions. And yeah, people maybe forgot how to be civil in some senses. We all entered back onto the planes and people are yelling at flight attendants <laughs> and you're going to restaurants. And again, um, you know, people are rude. Um, part of that's them forgetting the social niceties, being isolated in different ways and being really stressed out for a very understandable reason. You know, there was this big shock to our lives. Um, and again, some of it's unintentional, but then some of it is intentional. Hi, I'm Amanda Stevens, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Monash University Accident Research Centre. My background is in understanding driver behaviour. Amanda, welcome. Ah, oh, thank you. Do you think we are becoming more angry? Definitely on the roads, people are saying that drivers are becoming more angry and aggressive. Um, but we don't actually know whether they are or whether we're just getting back into the swing of it yeah. and seeing our old habits rise again. When we talk about people feeling that we're getting angrier on the roads, is it just that we're getting angrier on the roads or we feel that it's getting angrier on the roads? Or is it just society in general? Like, do people just feel angrier in general? Is it the traffic? Is it just that we're getting used to being back in the traffic post-pandemic or is it that people are angry on social media and there's political instability and there's a war in Ukraine? Like what actually is going on? I think what we drive as we feel and we don't get in the car and return to a state of normal. So whatever's going on in our lives um, or, you know, more globally and we're feeling the effects of that, we don't leave that at the car door. So that sits in the car with us and it shapes how we drive. It shapes our tolerance to other road users. One thing I've noticed when I'm driving is that I will get, I'm more likely to get angry or annoyed if someone cuts in front of me or does something that I feel is rude, whatever, a bit aggressive. In a way that I am not, if I'm walking down the street and someone walks in front of me, what is it about driving that seems to up our agitation levels? Well, absolutely. And I think it's, there's a number of things. And I think it's because we have different social rules on the road. And part of that is also because we're in our bubbles. Yeah. We're de-identified. Uh, so we no longer have to feel we need to behave in a certain way. Hmm. So you're absolutely right. I wouldn't um, tut at someone in a supermarket if they were slow, but I might tut at another driver if they're, they're driving slowly. And I think, unfortunately, our vehicles give us a sense that we're alone on the road, we're protected by this big metal cocoon. So instead of seeing other drivers on the road, we see other vehicles on the road. So we're automatically separated mm. um, and it's sort of an us versus them at times. How would you define traffic incivility? What does uncivil behaviour on the road look like to you? It's not sharing the road uh, and that can come through in a number of ways. So it can be just being hostile or swearing or shaking your fist at another driver. It can be using your vehicle when you're angry um, and putting yourself and the other driver at risk. Uh, so it can be a number of things, but it's also not thinking about the repercussions of that behaviour. Mm. So, so I always say it's a bit like a ripple effect in the network. So if I'm, you know, a little bit rude to another driver that might make them angry mm -hmm. and then they might be a little bit rude or they might use their vehicle in a dangerous way when something happens down the track for them. 
So they might do that to another driver and that driver might become anxious mm. and they might change their driving behaviour and they might change their behaviour in a way that other drivers then become angry at them. So it's a ripple effect that can actually continue after that first driver's got off the road. So difficult circumstances make us tense and may cause us to react with less grace than we might otherwise. I'm rude to you, which makes you react badly to the next person and so on and so on. Things can spiral outwards quickly with far-reaching repercussions. If we're not navigating life guided by a moral compass, some of our most vital institutions are at risk. Hi, I'm Scott Stevens. I'm the ABC's Religion and Ethics Online Editor. I also co-host The Minefield on ABC Radio National. Hi, my name is Waleed Ali. I co-host The Minefield on Radio National with Scott Stevens. Uh, I'm a broadcaster and also an adjunct here at Monash University. By the way, Waleed's also my husband. Scott and Waleed, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. Scott, how would you define civility And what do you see as its relationship to contempt? Look, uh, it's probably best to say what civility is not. Civility is not politeness. Uh, It's not necessarily turn-taking, and it's not being demure in rigorous conversation. In fact, rigorous conversation can, in fact, be one of the purest, truest forms of civility. So I think civility, if you think about certain virtues or certain moral practices that attend to different aspects or areas of human life. There are virtues that are peculiar to politics, for instance. There are virtues that are peculiar to medicine or to being an academic. If you think about civility as the virtue that is particular to the life of the civitas, the life of the city, Mm -hmm. uh, or the life of, of human beings that have been thrown together by choice or by chance, in other words, it's the, it's the virtue that binds together a group of people that don't have anything else in common apart from the fact that they live together in some kind of common life. And so if you think about civility then as one of the ways that we cultivate the space between us so that we can have rigorous, rich, even severe conversation, so that we can deliberate together about what it is that matters most to us and about the ends that we ought to be pursuing together. And it's also the way that we negotiate those forms of radical, even rich disagreement uh, that might emerge when any group of people that are serious about their common life come together. Embedded in what Scott just said there is really the concept of answerability. Yeah. Right. Nice. So civility is cut off where one's response or one's declaration is such that it not only does not invite a response, but it holds oneself unanswerable to the person that you're addressing. Right? If I speak to someone in an uncivil way, I'm speaking to them in a way that actually is declaring to them, you know what, I have nothing to hear from you. And I'm speaking in a way that also says that I hold myself unanswerable to you. So whenever, whatever your response might be is more or less irrelevant. I'm now in a process of declaration. It's just declaratory mode. Um, and that is important because I mean, Scott sort of outlined the etymology of it, where you have the city being uncivil with one another, then the city really ceases to exist. The, the civilization cannot hold together because you no longer have any kind of answerability, you know, and in the context of um, democratic life, then democratic life falls apart because democratic life is all about exchange, negotiation, debate, disagreement, but disagreement can only happen when there is actually um, some kind of answerability. When Waleed mentioned before about contempt being morally inflected, I think that's really important because very, very few people today think about contempt as being an immoral act or something that's morally problematic. Instead, in our relationships, political, dialogical, contempt becomes one of the ways that we serve what we believe to be high moral ends. So you would say, for instance, that winning an argument against people that are palpably wrong that are obviously unjust, that are obviously on the wrong side of capital H history. Winning an argument is doing the work of the angels, right? And so all that matters is winning the argument. All that matters is bringing that particular page of history to a close. What doesn't matter is the way that you get there. So contempt contempt can be a way of winning an argument, but winning an argument in the worst possible way. 
of shutting down the possibility of response, but also accelerating the goal that you think is the only proper goal to reach in such a way that the other person who's just been vanquished has no part in that future, has no place in that. And I mean, if there's one if there's one concept, I think, that holds together the very idea of democratic life, it's that the way that you get to wherever you're going anticipates where it is you're going. You can't get to a just place through unjust means. You can only realize some future justice by pursuing just means on your way there. And it seems to me that civility is one of the ways that we honor the demands of justice in the meantime while mm. we're trying to pursue some kind of proper just end. John Rawls saw that there are two basic emotions that act like acid on any democratic society. One is envy. If you see another person as having something that's rightfully mine or that they have no entitlement to, then you look at somebody as, a, as an opponent rather than as someone who's a participant in a common life. The other one that he identified was contempt. When you see the other person as someone who really rightfully has no share in our common life and who needs simply to be vanquished, uh, rather than come to, I mean, understand is 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 too weak a term, but someone with whom I can discover a neighbor, someone through whom I can learn, someone who can in certain circumstances be my teacher. Then he says that's like an acid that drips through the entire thing. Scott and Walid say the breakdown of civility can be partially blamed on the fact that the Western world's gotten out of the habit of moral thinking. We tend to mostly consider our principles as they relate to major issues like power, oppression and justice, rather than interpersonal relationships. But another major factor is the de-identifying bubble that Amanda mentioned when we get into our cars. When we don't see each other as humans, we don't treat each other as humans. And the media and social media are a big part of the problem. When the barons figured out how to make media profitable, they figured out that the way to do it was to enlist people in a kind of morally inflected, enraged sense where they would have something to protect, usually against an enemy that was a bit of an abstraction. And I want to focus on that word abstraction, because that is in the end what media provides us with, a series of abstractions. Very few people will have met the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister exists as an abstraction, as an image that sort of flits in and out of your life usually in certain prepackaged moments within certain confines. Not a full human being. You don't know anything really about this person. Right? Now I want you to imagine if that's the way that media generally works. It's one thing for this to be going on at the top as a way of, you know, navigating and mediating, albeit imperfectly, our public lives through institutions that we really can't, have no practical way of accessing directly. But what happens when you multiply that by the demos? What happens when you multiply that by every single person or near enough, being on social media and engaging so that they are their own broadcaster at the same time as they are their own consumer. And interactions become more and more and more and more virtual in this way. And people become more and more avatar-like. People become more and more abstract. At that point, not only is contempt possible and permissible, contempt's almost inevitable. The gravitational pull of moral judgment, meaning the unreality of the person that you are speaking about. That is, they become a symbol that does not embody the full moral force of a human being. Contempt is almost something that gets precipitated um, involuntarily out of the that mix. The of that, though, is that we then become avatars to ourselves. Yes, exactly. Which is the when performative my, aspect of this. Yeah. yeah. When, when my enemy is just the digital embodiment of a cause who, that needs to be overcome, then I myself become little more than the abstract embodiment of a cause, which means even if this person is coming close to persuading me on a particular point, I cannot, morally speaking, politically speaking, I cannot at that point enlist the proper emotions that says, you know what, there is something radically human, even good here, to which I should respond. The way I think about it is politicians talk to each other this way. How often does a politician see the full humanity in their opponent and be persuaded by their argument? They don't. The reason they don't is this is a performative That's space. Right. And they are not pursuing actually persuasion. What they're pursuing is some kind of victory in a political conflict. And we, as people, look at our politicians like this all the time and go, oh, why do they have to behave like that? And I agree. Fair enough. That is a fair enough criticism. The great irony of our age is that all the citizens are becoming politicians. 
All the citizens are imbibing this mode of behaviour and adopting it. If we want to stop being avatars and start communicating as humans again, it would help to reach a consensus on the common good. But Lucas says it's becoming harder and harder to achieve that agreement. You mentioned um, moral civility and that being the kind of civility which is, is a deeper form of civility, our openness to other ideas, our commitment to the common good and to each other. I feel like that is an area where um, uh, we are struggling with at the moment. You know, it's so much of our conversations in the media, on social media, amongst friends seems to be about what we can and can't talk about, what is acceptable to talk about, our openness to other ideas, which ideas are acceptable and or not, uh, and even how we define what the common good is. Mm. Are you, in your research, are you seeing um, that this is a, a particularly important area? You've put your finger on one of the biggest challenges. Yes, it's an absolutely critical area. You know, as we've seen uh, growing recognition of diversity within our communities, and rightly so, we, at the same time, we come up against tensions on how we engage and talk about and talk to those communities and, in turn, how those communities want to be spoken to themselves. The idea of the democratic project emerging out of the Enlightenment in Western the Anglosphere particularly, uh, has in some ways broken down because those shared values are less visible. Yeah. And so our work is trying to find out what are the things that particularly in our research young people have in common and what do they have in common with their wider communities because we need to, I think we need to urgently come to some sort of consensus about that uh, even though we know it's going to change over time because we've seen it mm -hmm. change over time. But in the absence of having some uh, shared values, uh, it's creating very problematic discourses. And, I mean, this can be easily traced to the increasing individualization of society that we've seen since the late 1970s in the UK and Australia and the US, this uh, atomization where everything is located in the, in the individual. And this might emerge from, for example, uh, models of economics adopted by the right wing, but it's also just as evident in identity politics, which are deeply rooted in the self. Yeah. So the question then becomes, what do we have in common? Mm. What, are in our, what are our common interests and how should we behave in order to be able to even determine what those common interests are? That seems to me to be the biggest challenge. The road to greater civility may be rocky, but it's essential for the future of our world. Thank you to all our guests on today's episode, Dr. Walid Ali, Dr. Amanda Stevens, Scott Stevens, Professor Lucas Walsh, and Dr. Stephen Zeck. We'll be back next week to chart a path forward in our final episode of this season of What Happens Next. <laughs>